So as she mentioned, I'm going to be chatting about what it's like to be a pre-med student and sort of how I got to where I am and sort of where I'm at at the moment. But yeah, thank you all for joining me and I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. So I do wanna start with a disclaimer. So I am a pre-med student, as y'all know, and I am still a pre-med student. I am really early on and I have not been accepted to or admitted to med school yet. So please take my advice and my tips with a grain of salt because I think there are so many different perspectives as to what a pre-medical student should be like, and none of them are wrong nor any of them entirely correct. And my biggest piece of advice would be to make your pre-med journey your own and like pursue what you're passionate about. There's no single track to becoming a pre-med student. And honestly, if you had another student here, you'd probably have a completely different presentation. And so this is just what I've done. This is what's worked for me, but this is not going to be what everyone is going to do. And that's perfectly okay. So that's just my quick disclaimer there. And now I just wanna go into a short outline about what I'm gonna chat about today. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about before I got into college. So how I got to where I'm at and things like that. So mainly sort of my high school journey. And then I'm gonna talk a bit about my pre-medical experience and how that has been and sort of what it's like to be a pre-med at UC Berkeley and things like that. Then I'm gonna talk about preparing for medical school and applications and just some considerations gearing into that. And then finally, as mentioned, I'm going to open some time at the end to answer any questions. So I just wanna start with a quick introduction. So my name is Courtney, I go to UC Berkeley. I am a second year, so I'm just a sophomore. So again, pretty early on in my pre-med sort of journey, but I'm super happy to be here nonetheless. My major is nutritional sciences with an emphasis in toxicology. And my minor is global public health, which I completed this past summer. And I am considering a minor in data science, but that's not exactly set in stone yet. And that's sort of an example of how you can explore a little bit as a pre-med, like nothing has to be set in stone. You don't have to be pre-med. And like, I'm sort of pursuing these different avenues to see what I like. And now moving on to before college and how exactly I got to where I'm at now. So I think for me, there are three different pillars that are really important in sort of the college application process coming out of high school. And for me, those were academics, extracurriculars and leadership. So I'm going, gonna go into the specifics of each one. So academics, I'm sure y'all are familiar with. There's the numbers, the SATs, the ACTs, the GPAs, all of that. So for me, I took the SAT. You can also take SAT subject tests if you want. If, you, if there's a particular subject you're really passionate about or really enjoy or are really good at, you can totally take a subject test. And those, exam scores basically show that you're ready for the rigor of college, right? You can you can approach a standardized, te standardized test and apply your knowledge to something you haven't necessarily seen before. And things like your high GPA, like a high GPA, can signify that you are ready for college and college courses because you're doing well in high school courses and you, you've developed that ability to critically think. And so that's what those sort of test scores are indicative of. And you can do advanced placement or international baccalaureate classes. I know AP is a little bit more well-known than IB. I did both of them, but AP and IB do sort of the same thing. They show that you're ready. You can challenge yourself and go sort of above and beyond the general high school curriculum. And as I mentioned, your scores on these standardized tests really demonstrate your capability to apply your knowledge to something you haven't seen and as well as your ability to like synthesize what you've learned over the course of the year and to critically think about a situation you're presented with because essentially that's what you're going to be doing in the future wherever you end up right so finally in terms of academics you have things like dual enrollment i was not super aware of this when i was in high school but you basically can enroll in classes at a community college and take classes at the same time as when you're in high school and that's called dual enrollment. It's another way to demonstrate that you're ready for college, right? You're taking college courses along with high school courses. Like that's phenomenal, right? And you can also get a pretty good GPA boost there. But I do wanna mention like academics are only a really small, not really small, but small portion of the application. And there's so much more to you and so much 
more to a college application than your scores, basically. But again, important component, do the best you can in school, stay in school. <laughs> okay, so now turning to extracurriculars, I've sort of split them into three different types of extracurriculars. So we have intellectually stimulating extracurriculars, hobbies, and then community service. This is just what sort of worked for me and sort of touching on each of them, I think is really cool in an application and just showing like holistically who you are as a person. So in terms of intellectually stimulating things, sort of like what I did was I competed in math, um, like the national, regional, um, like local levels and stuff like that through Mu Alpha Theta at my high school. I also, and like that is a way of just demonstrating like, hey, I'm really passionate about this thing academic and I wanna go beyond what's taught in a traditional curriculum. You know what I mean? So it's really challenging yourself because math competitions are really, really hard. <laughs> um, and you could also go a different direction. You could go towards learning something new, like deepening your knowledge in a different language. So that's another thing I did. I ended up being accepted to Spanish National Honor Society at my high school. So really enriching my understanding of things like Spanish, um, different cultures of Latinx communities and as, um, and like obviously becoming better at Spanish because that's a really, really useful tool, especially for me living in California. Because if I do want to end up being a physician in California, there are tons of Spanish speaking families here. And so really demonstrating that I'm committed to learning beyond what's taught like traditionally. And next you can go into things like hobbies. So I have been dancing for probably I think over 10 years at this point and I do jazz dance. And so that's one thing that was definitely on my college application because that's something that's a huge part of my life and it's a huge part of what I enjoy and it shows who I am. In terms of other hobbies people can pursue, there are other sports, other arts, things like orchestra, things like marching band. So whatever you're passionate about, just because it's not like school related or something does not mean it's not valuable and not a valuable part of who you are. And finally, things like community service, I think is important because it shows that you are ready and willing to give back to your community. You understand the place of possible privilege that you may be in and serving others, I think is really, really valuable, especially in possibly being a future physician. Like if you wanna be a doctor, you probably want to help other people and serve other people. And so community service organizations are a great way to do so. So things like National Honor Society. I was also in the California Scholarship Federation, things like that, that are like service oriented. Now heading into leadership, you can really demonstrate your um, responsibility, you should demonstrate that you're reliable, you're professional and that you can take initiative by, for example, getting a job. So that's, that's a pretty, pretty cool way to show your leadership. Another way you can demonstrate leadership is leadership positions. So if the things like your extracurriculars, like mu alpha theta, so math club or whatever, you can apply to be an officer and run. And then if you get an officer position, that's great. And you have like a leadership position there and it demonstrates your passions and how you're ready to take initiative. Another thing you can do is start your own club. So when I was in high school, I started, or I helped start a club called Casa Esperanza, where we serve this women and children's shelter in Ensenada, Mexico to, um, and these women are, these women and children are survivors of domestic violence. And so that's something that I use to sort of channel my own passions. And finally, I think something really important is consistency. So leaders are dedicated. They are determined. They stick to what they do because they are passionate about it. And so if you're hopping maybe from place to place, from Red Cross to California Scholarship Federation, and then, then you're suddenly doing math competitions for like a few months, like it's, you want to show who you are and that you're passionate about what you're doing and not that you are sort of just wanting to do things because they might look good on an application. You know what I mean? Like we want to see who you are. And so what I always say, very cliche, quality over quantity, you really want to be doing things that you truly enjoy and are having a good time with because there's no point in doing things if you don't like them. <laughs> now, getting awards and getting honors along the way is great, right? But that shouldn't be the goal of your extracurriculars or anything like that, right? Do, do what you love. Awards would be great. It'd be cool. But I mean, I don't think that should be the end goal. Okay. So now just to sort of solidify everything quality over quantity, please do not overload yourselves with AP and IB courses, right? Like 
you can take IB diploma. I know many people who have done IB diploma, which is basically like the full course load of IB classes, essentially. And if you end up not doing well, you're not going to get the GPA boost, right? If you end up not doing well on the exam, it'll show that you weren't really able to gauge your capabilities and able to spread yourself, think you're spreading yourself too thin, essentially, right? So be aware of overloading yourself, like carry as much as you can while still being able to do well. I think that's more important than just doing a full load of courses where you're feeling like you're slacking behind in every single one of them, you know? So there's one sort of tip there. Second and third, basically what I'm gonna say this entire presentation is pursue extracurriculars you're passionate about and spend your time and energy on what means most to you. Demonstrate who you are and not who you think you should be just because it might look good on an application. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about special paths now just towards the end because these are things I actually didn't really know about. So I am a first generation college student and I did not know these sort of paths existed. And so I wanna sort of expose you all to them in the case that you're in the situation that I was in. So BSMD programs are programs you can apply to sort of in the regular college application cycle, probably a little bit earlier, I'm not too familiar, but how they are is essentially it's a very rigorous application process at different schools where you can apply to both undergrad and medical school at a college. And if they accept you, you will go to their undergrad for however many years, and then you will immediately be accepted to their medical school in the coming years. I think each one has like different little um, requirements and things. So it might be a little bit different. I know some like you don't have to take the MCAT at all and things like that, but I don't know if that's the case for all of them, but they have them, I believe at like Brown University, possibly at like UMKC, things like that. Second, we have early assurance programs. So if you were like me and you did not know these things existed when you were in high school, there are things like early assurance programs where sophomores in college can apply to a program at a medical school. And if you're accepted, you will be guaranteed like acceptance to their medical school if you meet certain requirements, things like that. And then finally, not super common, but some people will take a gap year between high school and undergrad, which I think is really cool. Like if you have a really cool internship opportunity or a really good job opportunity that came up and you really, really want to pursue it, if you're not too worried about maybe delaying things a little bit, I'd say go ahead and take maybe a gap year. Like it really demonstrates your uniqueness and that you're really passionate about whatever it is. But I will say, don't take a gap year, just not be in school for a year. You should probably do something in your gap year if you're going to take a gap year. Um, so yeah, that's what I have sort of like the before my undergraduate experience aspect of things. And now I'm going to head into what it's like for me to be pre-med. So very similarly to being um, to like before college, there are different like pillars of what I think is important, which are academics, social life, activities, and personal wellness. So academics, very similar. The numbers, the MCAT, the majors, things like that. I do want to say your major can be anything. You don't have to be a biology major to be pre-med. I think that's something that's sort of like a myth, <laughs> but I'll, I'll like talk about that in just a second. Now, social life. I think it's really important. I think you're in college, right? Like have fun. Don't like not talk to your friends because you're like studying or something like study with your friends or something. Like I think maintaining a social life is really important just to being well, like we're naturally like social animals, we're humans. And so like, I think it's really important. Just have fun. Like you're in college and you can definitely combine academics with social life, like study with your friends. I used to do that all the time when I was on campus and I still do it like over zoom with my friends. It's just it's a great way to keep that balance. And next we have activities. So extracurriculars, clinical experience, employment and research. I will talk about those, but as you can see, some of them are really similar to what I mentioned for the high school things. And finally, personal wellness. I think it's so easy for pre-med students and like med students and residents and all of us to get burnt out. And even like high school students, if you're taking a full load of like APIB courses, like you're, well, you can get burned out too. So. I think it's important to sleep. It's important to exercise, be mindful of like your situation and maintain like healthy habits. So like for me, I have never pulled an online for school ever. And I sleep like eight to nine hours a night. Like I don't, um, so like, I think it's really important to make sure you don't end up getting like burned out. So now I'm gonna tap into like each of these little things and just talk about them a little bit in more detail. So 
in terms of my academic experience, I have really, really enjoyed my medical school like prerequisite classes. So I've taken like Gen Chem, I've taken organic chemistry and I, that was my, my favorite. And so I know it's not something most people say, so I might be in the minority here, but I loved it. Like I absolutely loved it. I'm so sad I'm like done with it. But I will say like, taking classes you really enjoy are a lot better than taking classes you do not enjoy. So if you really don't like like biology that much, I mean, but you can still be pre-med, but if you're not like the best at biology and you're just not like what you're most passionate about, your major doesn't have to be biology or immunology or whatever the case. Like you can be a philosophy major and you can be pre-med. You can be a math major and you can be pre-med. I think those things are all really valuable and show like that you're a holistic person. Like you have multiple passions and you can pursue things beyond just biology it shows that you're well-rounded and things like that so my major is like nutritional sciences with an emphasis in toxicology and that's that is biology related but that's because I'm passionate about that and I enjoy that and toxicology has a little bit more of that chemistry aspect to it and as you notice like I really like chemistry and so just gearing your major towards what you actually truly love I think is important and it does not have to be biology and I'm gonna say like, this is sort of the advice I have in terms of like academics is use like resources provided by your school. So at Berkeley, we have the student learning center, which is called like the SLC and people will tutor you and stuff like that. I think there's no harm in asking for help if you need help with class. And second of all, I would say use your professors studying tips like for their class. And so I know like in the syllabus or whatever the case, like some professors will be like, the best way to study is like to use the textbook or whatever. And I say, I, like in my opinion, I think your teacher teaches that class. They've been teaching that class probably for years and they probably know the best way to study for their own class. If they say read the textbook, it might be in your best interest to do so. And that was in the case for like one of my first OCHEM classes. So I had an OCHEM class and the professor was like, yeah, you should always read the textbook. Like here are the pages you need to read. and people would always complain about like not doing well in the class. And I'd be like, well, are you reading the textbook? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, <laughs> maybe you should try it. <laughs> so yeah, I just think your teacher probably knows the best way to study for their own class. I know some people have different studying techniques that work for them, but if you're, I think you should definitely at least try whatever tips your teacher has to study. If you're, especially if you're not doing super well in the class with how or what you're studying right now. And finally, you've heard this for years, probably at this point, and you will hear this for years, but stay on top of your work. Don't cram for things. And what I will say is like, I myself have like a testing rule. And so uh, we have like midterms, we have finals and things in college. Um, and I always start studying for a midterm at least a week in advance, minimum a week in advance. And then I don't study the last two weeks or the, sorry, the last two days before the test. So I don't like in my last two days, I'm like, I probably can't learn anything else. Like I'm just going to be confident in what I do know. And I do not study for those last two days before the exam. And I think that is really good at keeping you accountable and keeping you in a good mindset. I think if you're cramming it, it you approach the test thinking, I don't know what I'm doing and I'm cramming all of this into my brain. And that's not the best way I think to approach an exam. But yeah, those are my tips about my academic sort of experience. I've really enjoyed classes at Berkeley. I love them. <laughs> and now I'm going to head into activities. This might take a while because there's a lot here, but there is clinical experience, as I mentioned before, leadership, extracurriculars, and community service. So I'll start with clinical experience. Right now, I am a lead volunteer doing clinical research at the University of San Francisco Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland. I am the lead volunteer for the Food as Medicine study, and we're studying things like food insecurity and patient outcomes. And there are tons of different ways to do like research. Like I chose clinical research. Some people will choose wet lab research. It's totally up to you. I really like clinical research because I'm still able to connect with patients while also experiencing the research process. And I'm more into interacting with people. I'm a very social person as opposed to like pipetting and stuff like that. Like it's just, it's whatever you're more geared towards. And I do want to say there are tons of different ways to get clinical experience and healthcare exposure, and I'm still working on mine. I'm still early on, as I mentioned. So I also have done shadowing. I started shadowing my like summer after my junior year in high school. Since COVID has happened, I've been shadowing virtually. I've shadowed like a pediatrician who is actually my PI with my clinical research. 
And finally, I've done things like pipeline programs. So I've done the Future Physician Leaders Program with the University of Riverside School of Medicine, where we were exposed to a bunch of different physicians in the Riverside area, and they told us about their specialties and things like that. And I thought it was phenomenal. Like you get to sort of expose yourself to a bunch of little things because I think a lot of people go into pre-med thinking like, oh, I want to be an OBGYN, but that can definitely change, you know? And I think you should expose yourself to what is at your disposal. And some other ways to get clinical research or not, sorry, clinical experience are volunteering at hospitals. You can be a medical scribe. You could be a medical assistant. Um, and I'm still working on finding positions like these. And so you don't have to be doing this now. I'm sure all of you are young. And yeah, I think this is not like, as I mentioned before, like this is not the only way to do things. Now, heading into leadership. I am in the American Medical Women's Association. I have been, okay, so I am the external vice president for the chapter at UC Berkeley. And I am one of the conference chairs on for like National American Medical Women's Association for the pre-medical division. So that's something I've really enjoyed and I've taken on like different leaderships within AMWA as well. So I'm the student lead on something called Humans Before Heroes. It's sort of a mental health for like physician mental health initiative, which I really, really am loved. And then I've also, I'm the pre-medical chair of the HPV and cervical cancer task force, which has been really amazing. And then I was also like one of the chairs for um, an exhibit about women physicians who are like suffragists during the suffrage movement. So leadership can really like demonstrate who you are and what exactly you're passionate about and what you want to take initiative on. So another thing I have in terms of leadership is a job. So I am a student brand ambassador for Kaplan Test Prep. I really, really love it. I love working with pre-medical students and helping them get to where they want to be because that's sort of what I'm doing right now, right? And so I absolutely love it. And that is sort of my job. And next, the Global Initiative Against HPV and Cervical Cancer. I am part of their Young Leaders Division on a national level, or I guess global level. <laughs> um, and I am the Outreach Chair, so I work a lot with just education, advocacy, working with our partners and things like that. So we work with partners like the National Cerv Cervical Cancer Coalition, and that's sort of my job there. And so those really demonstrate what exactly I love doing and what I love to spend my time on. Similarly, extracurriculars will do the same thing, sort of. So I am in the health worker program at UC Berkeley where um, students in residence halls go to health workers when they need like basic first aid. Maybe they sprain their ankle, maybe they need a Band-Aid, or maybe they need like direction to mental health services. So health workers are like a first point of contact. And I was a health worker for my first year in college. And now since it's my second year in college, I have applied and now I'm a program or I'm a coordinator for the program. And second of all, the Associated Students of the University of California, very similarly, I am an associate director under the Office of Senator Julia Castro in the Student Wellness Department. So I work on like university-wide public health promotion. So as you can see with things like the health worker program and my role in the ASUC, it's like, I'm very interested in public health and like university-wide health promotion. And finally, as I mentioned before, dance. I still dance. <laughs> I'm a dancer in dance works at UC Berkeley in the, or I'm a, in like the jazz side of things. Okay. And now community service, as you, as I mentioned earlier, I started a club called Casa Esperanza, or I helped start a club in high school. And then I went ahead and started it here at UC Berkeley. So I'm going ahead and continuing that, working with the moms and children in Mexico. And second of all, I helped do philanthropy event organization. So I am in Chi Delta at UC Berkeley, which is a sorority. And this past year, I was the internal philanthropy chair and I worked with the director of philanthropy to do philanthropy events for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. So I think over the course of 2020, I think we raised about $30,000. So it was phenomenal. I love it. And then finally, volunteering at the biotech research learning or the biotech learning lab at the Lawrence Hall of Science. So I didn't do this for very long. I did this from December through March because the, the Lawrence Hall of Science closed because of COVID. But that there, I basically taught little kids about things like algae bioreactors and pipettes and centrifuges. It was awesome. But yeah, those are just examples of things that I've done. 
and again, like this is going to be completely different for someone else, like a different pre-med student. And there's like, I separated it into these four things, but there's a lot of overlap between them. I'm sure y'all notice, like with leadership and extracurriculars and things. But yeah, essentially these activities can really demonstrate who you are, what you're passionate about and how you take these passions and you translate them into actions. And so I think that's what's really important about them. So finally, I'm gonna head into the personal wellness side of things. So things like exercise. I work out nearly every day for at least 30 minutes. Rest days are important. You shouldn't work out every single day. I think that would be not good if you're working out hard every single day. But yeah, like find what works what best for you. Like I hate running. I don't run ever, but I do like Pilates and things like that. Sleep. I usually sleep eight to nine hours a day during the semester, which is very true. Never pulled my mind for school. I don't think I ever will. Um, and I mean, honestly, like this, this part of that is like, I know I probably couldn't be an ER, probably couldn't be an ER surgeon because I would not get as much sleep and I'd probably not do very good. At, like I would be horrible at that. So like knowing that aspect of me is also really important, I think. And I mean, I think it, again, really mitigates burnout. You're not going to get as burnout if you're sleeping well and doing well and exercising, because obviously exercising relieves stress. And finally, healthy habits. So doing things like doing things like eating breakfast every day, not sleeping out on like hygiene. Like I am not gonna kid you. Like people during midterms get so stressed. They're like, I cannot shower today. Like I am gonna study. <laughs> and so like don't like not skipping out on those things. I think really important. Just establish that routine. But I will say this isn't gonna work for everyone, right? I think it's really important to acknowledge that not everyone can afford to eat a healthy breakfast every morning. A lot of people at college do experience food insecurity, and I think that's important to just recognize. Now, I want to head into things like the like path for applications and stuff. So this demonstrates that the road to medical school is not straight. There are opportunities at every single turn, and you really don't have to take all of them. So starting with research, not everyone's going to do it. I really liked it, but if you maybe don't enjoy it, then you don't have to do it. <laughs> and I know some people say like, it's really good for your med school application. And that's true. At some schools, they really do value research. Some schools value research more than others. But if you are writing about something, it's very clear if you're not passionate about it, you know? And again, like your application should be a representation of who you are and you create a story about yourself with it. Now, there's clinical experience, which is very important, right? You're demonstrating that you're committed to clinical medicine. And I think that's really a place for you to explore different fields. You can explore primary care, internal medicine, surgery, things like that. Now, statistics, things like GPA, MCAT, very important. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot in addition to that. So I don't think you should bank only on those things, nor should you be discouraged if you aren't as strong in some of those things. And next, leadership and community service. Again, this demonstrates your passions. This demonstrates that you can take initiative. You can work in a team and you want to serve others. And these are, these are traits that are perfect in being a physician, right? So demonstrating those aspects of you, I think is really important. And finally, gap years. And this is what I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on. Gap years are optional, but I do plan on taking one and most people do. The average age of matriculation into medical school is getting older. It's, I think, around 25 now. Don't quote me on that, but it, it's somewhere up there. And they essentially allow you to gain experience. You're going to end up being a more competitive applicant, and you can pursue something that's really awesome. So I'm going to chat a little bit now about gap years between undergrad and medical school. So there are a few different things you can do in your gap years. You can gain clinical experience, or you can pursue some other passions. So you can work as a medical scribe, a medical assistant. You can shadow. You can volunteer. And you can do things like clinical internships. But you could also pursue other passions. So I know a really phenomenal, phenomenal med student. Her name is Rachel. She is in the JMP program at UCSF and UC Berkeley. And she did a Fulbright in Malawi for her gap year. And that is phenomenal. I know most people, not a lot, not a lot of people have the means to do that. But if you do, if you, and if you're passionate about it, I think you could totally do that and internships that aren't necessarily clinical. So public health internships. I know the CDC has a really, really rigorous public health internship. I think it's called the Public Health Associate Program. So if you're interested in public health, that's another avenue you could go in. And then finally, you could do something like pursue a master's degree. That's actually pretty common. I know someone getting a master's at um, 
Case Western Reserve University during her gap year. And I think that's phenomenal. If there's something you're passionate about and you wanna gain a little bit more expertise, that's a great way to go too. Now I want to head into the application timeline. Now this is gonna look a little bit stressful. Please don't get stressed, <laughs> but I'm not gonna go into every single little detail about this. I just wanna present this and give y'all an understanding that like the application timeline for medical school is long. And I do wanna say this timeline is from Kaplan Test Prep. I do work for them, <laughs> but yeah. So primary applications for medical school open in May, like early May, and interviews happen like from the end of the year through like April and then rolling admissions happen from the end of the year through April. <laughs> But um, before that, like how it works is if you don't want to take a gap year, you have to apply the May of your junior year, not your senior year, right? So it's a long process. And the like what makes it really difficult to not take a gap year is that you have to take the MCAT so early. And sometimes you haven't taken like the proper classes to take your MCAT and like do well, right? So if I need to apply summer of junior year, like if I need to apply May of junior year to not take a gap year, then I need to take my MCAT before that. But I'm not taking biochemistry until fall of my junior year. So I only have spring semester junior year to study for my MCAT and that's not enough. You know what I mean? So just keeping those things like that in mind. So I'm definitely gonna take a gap year and that's totally okay. I think it's a great path to go, but I just want y'all to keep in mind that like in thinking about applications and things like that, you need to sort of think ahead in terms of like, do you want to take a gap year or not? Because your MCAT will creep up on you if not. Okay. And yeah, just essentially planning is really important. And I do want to say timelines differ. Like you don't have to take the MCAT in this timeline given by Kaplan. I know a lot of people who just study during the summer and they take it at the beginning of their senior year or something. And then they apply the summer or like May of the, at the end of their senior year. And then they take one gap year and then they're like, they go to med school. And I know this is really confusing. So if anyone has any questions about this afterwards, we can chat about it. But I suggest like taking a look at the timeline when you have a chance and just figuring all of it out. Um, and yeah, so now I just wanna end with my biggest takeaways, which Again, you've heard me say this throughout this presentation, which are pursue your passions and not just things you think will help your application. Because if you think something will help your application and you write about it and you don't write about it very nicely because you're not very passionate, it's not gonna help your application. And numbers are really important, but they aren't everything. You are not tied down to medicine yet. So I really wanna emphasize this because I know a lot of y'all are young and you do not have to do medicine, I think. I think you have so much time to explore. Like you can explore public health. If you're interested in health, like maybe public health, maybe bioengineering and stuff. Like there's so many different directions you can go. And I don't think you need to be tied down to medicine just yet. I know plenty of people who have thought like they were like, I want to be pre-med. And then it's like their junior year of college. Like you have so much time. And like, I really just think, I think it's important to find time exploring yourself before you commit yourself to something. And finally, take care of yourself along the way. Don't get burned out or try not to. It's, it's very difficult not to, but do what you can. And finally, there's no right or wrong pre-medical journey. Everyone's gonna do it differently and it's not wrong, it's not right, and it's unique to you. So finally, I just wanna end with a thank you and say that I'm happy to answer any questions. And I have these flowers in this background because I know talking about the future and things like that can be a little bit stressful, but I just wanna say relax, like it's gonna be okay. This is a time for you to grow. And that's what these flowers represent. So I'm happy to answer any questions now and I will drop like my Instagram username in the chat. So you can always like message me if you have anything that comes up after this. But thank you so much for having me and happy to answer anything.
Okay, I got a question that says like, what is a day in the life? Like, what does a day in life look for me as a medical student? So to be clear, like I'm a pre-med student, like I'm not in medical school yet. Um, and it obviously is different because COVID, but <laughs> when we weren't in COVID, I used to take a lot of early classes because I like to wake up early in the morning. So like I wake up at like 6 a.m. and I sleep at like 10 p.m. So <laughs> I used to wake up early in the morning, I would eat breakfast and I would go to class. So class in the morning, lunch or whatever. And then the rest of my time of the day would be like allotted to my extracurriculars and like the health worker program and like my clinical research because I'd have to go all the way to Oakland and stuff like that. So it's like a quick answer to that question. I'm getting a lot of other things coming in. So I'm going to answer those too. Um, how do I manage my time? What are some good extracurriculars? So yeah, I think everyone has different tools for time management. I use Google Calendar because I love it. I think everything is just so compact and you can keep everything in one place because I can schedule my, ho my whole day out. And at the top, like, I can put my tasks and I can check them off as I go throughout the day. I think that's a really great, great way to manage your time. And you can manage your time over the course of like weeks. And I'm not good at using normal planners because I forget and my handwriting's bad. So <laughs> that's my best way to manage my time is just using Google Calendar. And I'm really not a procrastinator. So that's like one thing that people also don't resonate with me about because I cannot procrastinate. Like it gives me like stress. So I do everything in advance. Um, what are some good extracurriculars? Again, like your extracurriculars are gonna be geared to what you're passionate about. Like, as I mentioned before, my extracurriculars were things like dance. If you're not good at dancing, maybe, or like if you don't like dancing, maybe you shouldn't do dance. <laughs> or like some people will do like music and stuff like that. I probably wouldn't do that because I do not know how to play very many instruments. I can play the ukulele and the kind of the piano and that's it. So, <laughs> okay. Rather than majoring in biology, what other medical related majors do you recommend? So again, like it doesn't have to be medical. Some people do philosophy. Some people do math. Some people do like electrical engineering. Mine is nutritional science. <laughs> so major should be based on what you think you would enjoy the most. I consider doing a minor in math. I really like math. And like I used to compete in math competitions. And so that I'm compromising with maybe doing data science, you know? So how do you keep organized and maintain focus? Organized is like Google Calendar sort of stuff. Maintaining focus, I think even things like getting a good night's sleep is gonna help you with that. And also like finding a good place to study. So like, don't study in bed because you'll probably just go on your phone. <laughs> so like study at a desk. And I know sometimes it's hard to like pull yourself out of bed. <laughs> and like, if you need to study in a separate room then study in a separate room if you're like, your bed is too tempting. I'm looking this way because that's where my bed is, but um yeah if it's too tempting like don't study in your room like I know I have a friend who I chat about this with all the time this is actually like in the health worker program this is my like role is like being in charge of like hygiene and I call this mental hygiene like having separate spaces for things keeps you productive rather than doing everything and like everything sort of blurs together I feel like if you're studying in your bed and you're sleeping in your bed like you need to maintain hygiene between these different spaces so I have a place where I work a place where I sleep place where I work out, things like that. I think it keeps you productive when you get to this space, you're in the mindset of like, okay, I'm gonna work. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's one side of things. And like, I have a friend who has like a whole separate room for when he needs to do work. Okay. What inspired you to become a medical professional? Was the application process to university particularly hard or stressful? What advice would you give to those looking to work in the medical field? Okay, that was a lot of questions in one. Um, what inspired me to become a medical professional? Again. I think this is a personal, this is a, this is a, some people wouldn't agree with this. I think you don't really, really know you want to be in medicine until you've taken a bit of like a dive into the field, right? So I didn't know I wanted to be a doctor until I tried shadowing. And I was like, I really like this. And I really like what she's doing and stuff like that. So I think when you have your first few experiences, there will be, sometimes there's a moment for some people, there's like a click moment. And for me, that was it where it's like, I want to do this, you know what I mean? And so I think t getting experience in the field is really important for like finding what inspires you. 
And for me, a lot of that was like, I worked in a low income clinic and seeing health disparities, I think is, was what really pushed me. And also growing up in an immigrant family, I recognized a lot of like, not the most trust in Western medicine. And I think that I wanted to sort of change that. I read a book called The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, probably my favorite book ever. I recommend it if anyone wants to read it. But there's, yeah, there's a lot of distrust in Western medicine. And I think what I really, really want to do as a physician is deliver medicine in a most culturally sensitive way as possible, because a lot of time it's not necessarily the most culturally sensitive. And so that's that's part of what inspired me to like pursue medicine. The application process to university wasn't super hard. I mean, it's a little stressful just because it's like, am I going to get in anywhere? Because <laughs> there's a moment where it's like, I'm never going to get into college. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, <laughs> but that's probably not going to happen. You're going to get into college. I remember I was freaking out before I got into um, Berkeley and I thought I wasn't going to get in anywhere I wanted. Um, let's see. How do you choose which undergrad pre-med program will be best for you in order to get into a good medical school? Should the university you apply to be very high ranked or prestigious. I don't think that's the biggest deal. I mean, I think it's nice to go to a high ranked university, but some people can't like afford to do that. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's taking into account those factors. I think that's most important in like a holistic, a holistic evaluation of an application. So I think it's less about like, I mean, obviously it's nice to be at a, like a prestigious school, but if you're at a prestigious school and then like doing really, really bad in your classes, I don't think that matters. You know what I mean? Like you should prioritize most like doing well in your classes and things like that, as opposed to like what school you go to. Okay. Um, how to study in college, how to balance extracurriculars. I sort of talked about that already how to balance or how to build relationships with, with professors. So you've probably heard this from people a lot, but it's like, you should go to office. I love office hours. Um, I love chatting with my professors. Like I have a professor that just wrote me like a letter of frack and stuff. And it's like, the only reason I was like ready to ask her is because she like we chatted all the time in office hours. I went every week and like, we really got to know each other. And so like, for example, if you like, I'm assuming you want to build relationships with professors because you want a letter of rec. And so they really need to know who you are to write a strong letter of rec. So like going to office hours is a great way to get to know your professors. Okay. Do you perhaps know the process at Berkeley, the application process at Berkeley for international students? I actually do not. We have a lot of international students, but I don't really know how it works. I'm so sorry. Um, I know a few international students. So if you want to reach out to me, like DM me on Instagram. Oh, I forgot to put my Instagram in the chat. Okay. Yeah, if you want to DM me on Instagram, I will get back to you on that because I know quite a few international students. Okay. Where are the questions? Okay. How did you find the opportunities for research and clinical experience? That's a really, really, really great question. There are tons of different ways to do it, right? There are application processes you can go through. So at Berkeley, we have something called URAP. I honestly don't know what it stands for, but <laughs> it's basically where you can apply to like different research positions. I've found that it's really competitive. I actually, actually never had applied, but it's really, really competitive. A lot of people get rejected, but other ways you could do it are like cold emailing. My sister literally cold emailed like her research PI and she's been there for probably like two years at this point, like cold emailing is a great way. I got mine through like an academic advisor who, cause like my academic advisor is the academic advisor for like nutritional science. And she was like, oh, there's this nutrition like clinical research spot opening. So I like went through that way. Um, but there are tons of different ways. Like I think cold emailing, I've cold emailed someone before like, and then I got an interview I did not get the position and that's okay. You know, like, it's fine. I'm like moving forward, like it's not a big deal. And like, you will get interviews and maybe you won't get accepted and like, that's okay. You'll find a different lab that works for you. Okay. Hi, I'm in grade nine high school. I'm interested in medicine and I'm just exploring medicine. Can you tell me what you went to after high school? Like what's the order? Oh, okay. Yeah. So high school, university, medical school, residency, if you want to, or if you need to, fellowship, and that should be it. Cool. 
Okay. <laughs> and the book I mentioned was The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down. Really, really, really good book. But yeah, that was all of the questions. I tried to answer them quickly so I don't go on a tangent because I tend to do that. If anyone has any other questions, I'm totally open to answering them. But yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really, really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here with us and helping us get a little bit more insight into you know, how it's like to be a pre-med student. So thank you so much for that. And we have three more webinars coming up one which is next week for a medical student, um, how she came to be a medical student and what she like, what her pre-med experience and her medical school experience. Um, so please stay tuned for that and definitely join us. And thank you so much, Courtney, for being here. Thank you for having me. So um, that being said, yeah, you guys can always um, DM Courtney on Instagram if you have any questions. And I think that's it. So thank you everyone for attending and we hope to see you next week with Kelly, I'm a med student. So yeah, definitely you. please reach out. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.